Hello, my name is Jeffrey Nicholas. I am an associate professor of philosophy at Providence College. This is a recording lecture uh, in a series of lectures on Alistair McIntyre's Dependent Rational Animals, and we are on chapter eight, Virtues and Becoming Independent Practical Reasoners. This chapter is a little longer than the ones that have come before, and even a little longer than some that come after, uh, but it all centers around how we become independent practical reasoners and the focus on the development uh, from childhood to adult uh, independent practical reasoners. Keeping in mind, of course, that we are all vulnerable, that some people uh, are vulnerable in ways that prevent them from becoming independent practical reasoners, uh, and we will look at those issues as we go forward. Uh, up until this point, we have compared the human animal to the non-human animal in a variety of ways, uh, but particularly in terms of uh, acting for reasons and having beliefs. And what we realized were that uh, non-human animals can have beliefs and can act for reasons even though they don't have language, but human animals have the capacity uh, to evaluate their reasons for action and their beliefs because of language. And so when we talk about uh, developing into independent practical reasoners, what we're talking about is that ability to stand back from our desires and evaluate them. So if you skip ahead in this chapter to page 96, he gives a sort of overview of what he's been doing and what he's trying to talk about in this chapter. Uh, it, it is a problem sometimes that McIntyre uh, tends to write in ways where he stops for a second and says, this is what I've been doing. And the reader's like, I didn't realize that's what you've been doing. Uh, so it's nice to kind of look at those uh, passages when we have a chance and to think about what we've read before. Uh, so if you skip ahead to page 96 and read that, and then go back to the beginning of the chapter and read. So he says, one thing that we've been doing is looking at the distinctive features of human reasons for action. And that distinctive, fe the primary distinctive feature is our ability to evaluate our reasons for action. So why did we do the thing that we do? Was that a good reason for doing it? There are characteristics that are necessary for sound practical reasoning that we have looked at and will continue to look at. And then uh, what we owe in terms of the virtues and the development of the virtues that are necessary in key relationships in our life that are necessary for practical reasoning. So we recall as well that one of the things that we've learned in this discussion, not only for human animals, but for non-human animals like dolphins and wolves, is that uh, our ability to reason depends on our relationships in life. So what he wants to do then is talk about the the development of the child, and he calls this a detailed account of the development of a child. Of course, this is a detailed account within one chapter of a small book. Obviously, uh, someone else might give a, a whole book about this, but we're looking at some specific features here. And one of those specific features is that we begin with this animal experience as children, right? What kind of needs do we have and how are those satisfied? And that begins, uh, we could say it begins uh, pre-birth, but certainly with birth, we are talking about this animal experience of having needs and having them satisfied. And for the human being, as well as for the dolphin and the wolf and chimps and the other great apes, we enter into a pattern of receiving and giving. Now in the human animal life, this pattern of receiving and giving is much more detailed, is much more um, uh, developed in terms of the different ways that it can happen across cultures uh, and within the individual family, etc. One of the distinctive features here, though, for human beings is that where dolphins cannot look back at the care they have received, human beings can. And so we know many movies have been built around this capacity of human beings looking back and saying, you know, I didn't get the care that I, I needed when I was a child, but I can still develop from that, or this is how that has caused me problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so hopefully that is a way for not only children, but for adults to learn uh, to be better carers in the future. And part of what makes that possible is that human beings experience time in ways that we don't think the non-human animal does. Uh, so even though a dog might experience the, the missingness 
right? Missing uh, the dog's uh, human, the dog doesn't experience that as a sense of time, whereas the human being does experience it as a sense of time. And also that we have memory, and a memory that helps us to develop the language that we use to evaluate our desires, so that we know that when we were seven, we might have desired one thing and we learned how to evaluate that and now we desire something else, or maybe we desire the same thing, but for uh, different reasons. McIntyre continues this discussion of the child development by, development by noting that we need relationships that foster our ability to evaluate, modify, or reject our own practical judgments, right? So we have to be able to step back and say, why am I doing this? Why am I majoring in business rather than art? Or why am I taking this class now rather than in the summer or in the spring, right? Or it might just be, you know, why am I committed to voting this way rather than that way, right? Now, part of the, one of the, the vulnerabilities that we human beings experience here is our failure to separate our desires from the individuals that help us become independent practical reasoners, right? We become too dependent upon those people. And so oftentimes we hear people say, I'm doing this, and, and we can't really figure out why they're doing that. And then maybe one day we realize, or they realize themselves, that they're doing it because it's what their parents do. And we often see this in terms of voting, right? People vote the same way that their parents do and have always done. And so this family has always been Republican or this family has always been Democrat without looking outside of that particular uh, family history. And we see the same thing with careers, right? Uh, so this person becomes a lawyer because their dad and their, their grandpa were lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So what the adult must do is teach the child to follow the child's desires and not the adult's desires. And that's difficult both for the adult and for the child. It also means that we can fail to recognize our own dependency. So if I am dependent on someone else and I fail to recognize that, then I can't become an independent practical reasoner. I'm too dependent upon that person. Also, we have to recognize that we can fail to, rec to understand our own unity as an agent. Why am I doing this at work and this at family and this uh, in the ballpark? If I'm doing different things in those areas, then I'm not understanding myself as a unified agent. And I sort of live this kind of sporadic haphazard life in which I'll never be fulfilled because I can't bring these parts together. And here play is often necessary because it releases the creative powers, both physical and mental, by which we develop our independence. And that's true certainly of children, but also as, as adults, right? And so how do we play in ways that help us to develop as this kind of person to eva evaluate the needs that we have and the reasons that we have for uh, pursuing those needs? What we hope happens then is that there is a transformation of the motivational set, right? So I, I, I used an example before where if the alarm goes off, I get up and I go to work, right? And I'm not thinking about the reasons I'm going for work or the reasons I'm getting up out of bed. That's part of my motivational set. And so every once in a while, you know, around New Year's perhaps or other times or birthdays or times when we go uh, for reconciliation if you're Catholic or some other form of, uh, of uh, retreat, right? We have to think about our motivational set and think about whether we need to change our reasons for action uh, and what reasons we might have for changing that, right? I think the character of Rory Gilmore in The Gilmore Girls is an interesting character to look at that, uh, at these issues because of the transformation of her desire to go to Harvard uh, to a desire to go to Yale, right? And the sort of struggle that she had distancing herself from her mother and that because her mother didn't want her to go to Yale, but also coming up with her own reasons for going to Yale that were related to, but not dependent upon her grandparents going to Yale, right? Uh, so we have to think about the external reasons versus the internal reasons and how those can change and become internal how my desire for uh, for something, going to yell or for chocolate ice cream or for whatever, uh, why I want that desire because it is my desire and then changing that so that I'm desiring it because it is what's good and best for me, right? And so 
In doing this, what we do is we develop these distinctive human powers that we have, powers for language, the powers for analysis, powers for memory, and powers for developing our uh, capacities for uh, individual thinking, right? Now, some of what we need here, of course, are the virtues, okay? These are necessary for the transitions because they help us to be brave enough to make our own choices, to be separate when we need to be separate, but also uh, temperate enough so that we know when we need to be dependent, okay? And so uh, often what we hear in the common uh, parlance of everyday capitalism and the neo, uh, not, uh, sorry, the neoliberal state is that virtues are something that are generally good and naturally agreeable. And what McIntyre wants to convince us of is that virtues are not generally good and naturally agreeable because they involve uh, transforming our desires. Right. And the consumer market doesn't want us to transform our desires. They want us to spend money and buy lots of things and throw away one thing because we get bored with it and buy something new and then throw that away because we get bored with it. Right. Whereas virtues themselves require us to temper our desires and go through the process of transforming them. And that means stepping back from those desires and evaluating them and learning to develop new desires, right? And we do this in a range of practices, whether that's baseball or soccer or music or philosophy or whatever kind of practice we might be involved in. Part of what we're doing in that practice is we hope learning to evaluate our reasons for action and tra transforming those reasons. And what we see in the modern world, uh, particularly with a drugging in uh, sports, is that people are not learning to evaluate their desires. They're not learning what to do in practices. And instead, they're going for the easy fix because that's part of the consumer market. Okay. So part of what's necessary for us, sorry about that, is to have mothers, parents, and teachers who can put us to the test in uh, experiences where we can develop the virtues and where we can test our own commitments, right? And test our own reasons for doing. But that means that the mother and the parent and the teacher must be committed to the child as my child or as my student, right? And there's a certain unconditional commitment here. How am I responsible for this child or for this student going forward? And that means recognizing that the needs of the child are not my needs, right? As a teacher, your needs are not my needs. I have pr particular needs that I need to satisfy, of course, but you also have needs that are independent of mine and which you need to satisfy. And so my question is, how do I help you to evaluate those needs in an independent way and make sure that you're acting for reasons that lead to your flourishing, okay? Uh, and of course, parents can... Um, uh, model this behavior, and McIntyre says that the parents of the seriously dis disabled are paradigms of good parenting, okay? The point is, according to McIntyre, to bring the child to where he or she can be educated, okay? And what that does that mean? What are the features there? First, it means that I can stand back from my own desires, right? So that's the first thing. Second, that I can evaluate my desires. And third, that I can... Uh, understand that my having reasons for this thing uh, can be part of my ev ability to evaluate those reasons. So, right, part of what I'm doing is revising my reasons, revising my desires, abandoning them, and replacing them. And so there's a give and take dependence here, right, between myself and those who I depend on to make me educated so that I can stand back, so that I can evaluate, and, that, and so that I can uh, 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 understand that power of evaluation as what makes me truly human. And again, this is something that we all struggle with in a consumerist capitalist society because the, the, the point of consumerism and capitalism is not to stand back from our desires, but to simply consume what is there before us. And that doesn't help us to become independent practical reasoners. So we are going to pause here and I will continue this chapter in uh, a second video uh, for it.